Well, strong political opinions are essential if you're hosting a program on a current affairs network such as Sky News. But that's not the only attribute required. Life experience matters as well, and it's especially handy if it comes from years inside the political circus, the tent. And that's what my colleague Chris Kenny brings to the desk each afternoon on The Kenny Report, because Chris spent almost a decade working for a state premier, then a foreign minister, and even federal opposition leader by the name of Malcolm Turnbull. It's time to get an insider's view. Chris Kenny, welcome to the couch. Thanks for having me, Chris. This is different. You've got to answer the questions, not ask them, mate. Very disarming. Very disarming. <laughs> <laughs> the, the least known fact about you... Oh, no. And I didn't know about this, and the boss didn't even know about this when I told him five minutes ago, is that you were the full-on, long-haired, greeny park ranger saving the environment. I indeed had a lot of hair. I had a lot of hair. In fact, I've only ever had one nickname in my life, Chris, and that was Springhead. And, uh, yeah, I had a lot of hair and uh, I was going to be a park ranger. I studied wildlife and park management and I worked on contracts in national parks. Looking after the corroboree frog and saving the ozone layer. All, all of that. No damn stickers on my car and all that. But Bob Brown was my hero. <laughs> I, met, I met him years later when I was negotiating with him uh, working for Malcolm Turnbull. But back in the early 80s uh, during the Franklin uh, Dam protests, uh, Bob Brown was my hero. I yeah. bet. I mean, <laughs> the song, you, you probably sang the song with him as well. <laughs> yeah, I was full on, yeah. All right. You transferred into journalism. You found your course. Um, and then you worked for a little place in Renmark, the little uh, two-horse town. And what uh, was the Murray Pioneer, I think it was? It was the Murray Pioneer. It was still going. The locals used to tease me and say I was working for the Murray Diarrhea, as was they called. But they loved their local paper. Yeah. It's still going. I'm in contact now and then with people up that way. It was great fun to go from the city to work in a country paper. That was the way to get your start. I'd done a year of... Uh, uni studying journalism and I went up there for a summer holiday and they offered me a job to stay on so I stayed on and I finished my studies many many years later but the Murray Pioneer was a great paper and you get to meet so many people and really learn the ropes and I played footy for the the local club the Renmark Rovers we were a pretty good footy club we lost the grand final in uh, 85 it was but um, and you've never forgotten it <laughs> <laughs> but here you were prepared to go to the bush to begin your career I did exactly the same said goodbye to the girlfriend the parents took the family car didn't come back because that was the way you started skip forward to 2020 2021 we've got 70,000 job vacancies in agriculture in just Queensland alone kids in the city don't think the same way we did no, they should. They should go and take those opportunities. Look, I remember driving through Renmark uh, in the years before I went there to work and I thought, oh, gee, uh, I knew country towns, but bigger towns. And I thought, well, how, how do people keep busy here? Once you move there and work into these local communities, it's non-stop. You get to know everyone, whether everyone. it's sport and other events and down on the river uh, and helping each other out. And so it's a great environment to, to live and work in the country. And, yeah, I think more people should do it now. Whatever the calling, whatever the job, go and take it. You'll love it. And you rose in the ranks to work for everyone from the ABC to Channel 10 to Channel 9. I'll come back to the 7.30 report a little bit later. <laughs> but then you decided in 2000 to take, uh, I guess, a, a familiar course because it was something you love, politics. You were helping a Premier, a State Premier, the South Australian Premier, then Alexander Downer, and all of a sudden, the whole world was in front of you. You racked up some frequent flyer points, didn't you? Look, it was just fantastic to work for Alexander Downer. I didn't know him very well when I started working for him. We became very good mates. We're good mates now. But to work for the Foreign Minister... To me, it was just so exciting. I'd always had an interest in foreign affairs. I'd never travelled much. I'd been overseas once. Right. And, uh, and uh, I might have got a second trip in for work. Uh, but over the ensuing years, uh, world leaders into the White House, into the 10 Downing Street, into the Blue House in, in Korea, uh, the axis of evil countries, Iran, North Korea. Iraq, North Korea. Iran? Iran, Tehran, met with the, the mullahs there. It was, it was fascinating. And to, to deal with the issues we were dealing with, it was the, the Iraq war, uh, terrorism. I went to Bali after the bombings. I went to... Southeast Asia after the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, we're dealing with so many difficult in tough the thick issues of it. in the thick of it. And, and Alexander and I were very close. I met so many other people uh, who were very important in those days, various ambassadors and, and world leaders. And, of course, some of the colleagues in the office too, the people I work with in Alexander's office, uh, Alan Tudge, Josh Frydenberg, Greg Hunt... On the way up. Innes Willox, Peter Wolcott. Uh, yeah, people who are now in very uh, important positions and... Uh, 
and, and we uh, we forged some pretty strong friendships in those I days. I bet you did, which is always handy for what you do now. Mm. Well, tell us about the time that you were in the National Security Committee of Cabinet, in that room, thinking about something that was decisive for the Pacific, and you're a little bit distracted. Yeah, I remember that. It was a, a great memory of John Howard. It was a, it was a, it was a real responsibility and honour to sit in on the National Security Committee of Cabinet. I was Chief of Staff to the Foreign Minister, so I would sit there as a, as a note taker and observer. And th this dealt with very, very serious issues. Of course, that uh, classified issue only. And at that time, I remember. Uh, I think it was uh, early in the early in maybe two thousand and five or six, I'd have to check the diary, but we were, we were looking at uh, the situation in the Pacific. I think another coup was looming, uh, courtesy of Frank Barney Marama in Fiji. Fiji right. And we were looking at what Australia should do there. And um, in and out of the room, uh, notes would be passed every half hour or so uh, because no phones, no communications were allowed in the Cabinet room. The notes were handwritten notes about an update on the Test match, where I think where Shane Warne, Shane Warne was bowling Australia <laughs> to victory. I think but from memory at Adelaide Oval, I'd have to check, but uh, it was great. And, of course, the Prime Minister, John Howard, would get these notes and as the conversation uh, continued on very serious matters. He'd just give a quick little update on the test cricket for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Australia. Exactly. Eh? Yeah. How incredible. And there were some sad times too. You, you remember vividly of a plane crash in, in Indonesia, which would have shocked you because you personally were very close to being on that plane. Yeah, that was a terrible trip and uh, there's been a lot of focus on that. A, a number of Australians killed a number of Indonesians when the plane crashed in uh, Jog, Jakarta. It's a trip I didn't do with Alexander. He went with a couple of other ministers. I helped some journalists get onto that trip and we put on some VIP flights. Uh, and uh, so I was very close to, uh, to some of the uh, DFAT staff on board and also Cynthia Bannum, uh, a Sydney Morning mm. Herald journalist. Uh, it changed her life. She's been an inspiration the way she's moved on from that. But uh, she was very, very badly injured and uh, it really changed her life. She's now a number one ticket holder at the Sydney Swans because of the courage she's shown yeah. in recovering from that terrible accident. What a story she is. What a story. Then you found yourself in the office of Malcolm Turnbull, <laughs> now the president of the miserable Ghost Club. He's pretty miserable now, yeah. Look, I, I, I went But you to... would have been close allies. Well, yeah, I fought uh, shoulder to shoulder with him. I was in the trenches for him that, that year. I call it my year of living dangerously. It was a very difficult year. And uh, I, I learned firsthand that being the leader of the opposition is the most difficult job in the land. And Malcolm Turnbull had an enormously difficult task through the GFC and through the uh, climate uh, policy, the... Uh, the ETS. The ETS uh, situation. So it was a really, really tough time. And, yeah, I was... Uh, that was my my job 24-7 was to be with Malcolm to try and help him get through that. And you, was... you would have respected his intellect. Did you respect his the way he worked the political room or was he an amateur? Look, there's certain political skills that he didn't have, others he had. Uh, Mal Malcolm was very good at working out an end game. Uh, working out uh, through the detail to work out how to get to an end point. He was not, obviously. I think the record shows for everyone, and we demonstrated that in our documentary, Men in the Mirror, he didn't have the ability to bring everyone with him. Uh, and uh, that's something people learn in politics. It's a, it, it's a characteristic, but I think also people who are in politics for a long time learn it. And someone like Malcolm Turnbull, who's been successful in the law and in business, didn't have a long heritage in politics hadn't learnt that skill. See, in business, if you've got the right idea and the power and the force, you can crash your way through on your own. As you, you don't can. need to have patience. You don't. And same as a barrister, the force of your argument can win the day. But in politics, it doesn't matter how good your argument is. You've got to bring everyone with you. Were you in the room the time that Tony Abbott and Nick Minchin moved in and said, we're hearing what the public's saying about your ETS love-in with Kevin Rudd, we're out of here? Yes, I was in that room. There were four of us in the room. Nick Minchin... Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull and myself. So they're some of the insiders' uh, developments, little bits of history you get to be part of when you take those roles. That's Did a very it get powerful heated? movement. It wasn't very heated, no. It was very, very direct and it was very powerful. These uh, two front benches were resigning to Malcolm and saying that they would continue to resign and they wouldn't uh, guarantee that they would support his leadership unless he abandoned his position on an emissions trading scheme. So it was very much the leadership coming to a head and Malcolm knew, we knew that uh, he was uh, probably going to be for the high jump within days. Mm. Did he contact you 
before, during or after you put together that documentary for Sky News? No, I haven't heard from him since. Um, Doesn't I'm... surprise you, though? No, I think, look, uh, I think Malcolm needs to get over it. You know, he had a good crack. He got to become Prime Minister. He didn't succeed in that job. He was taken down, and uh, that's how he got the job in the, same, uh, in the first place. So I think uh, he and Kevin Rudd both need to find a way forward. It's not easy. I mean, I, I know Tony Abbott quite well, too. It's not easy for him, but he's trying to deal with it on his own privately, not by lashing out at everybody publicly. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to find another focus and move on. Julia Gillard's done it well. Brilliantly. What yeah. dignity. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a bit to do with her over the past couple of years. I've sat on some committees with her and she's just been full of energy and, and engaging and uh, we, we've had a... We've actually exchanged some views and, and she's finding a purpose in her life yeah. that uh, elevates her and gets things done and that's what former Prime Ministers have got to do. You once worked on the 7.30 report in the <laughs> Adelaide Bureau. You now have become almost in this place, the chief attack dog against the ABC. Have, have things changed since you worked with them? Has the, has the culture changed that much in that time? I think it's gotten worse, although it was pretty biased back then. Uh, you know, I was a bit of a lefty myself anyway, and certainly uh, my executive producer was the... Uh, was the branch president of the local branch of the ALP. <laughs> right. And uh, there was a certain direction that we were pushed. But I think it's gotten worse now. It's so brazen. And it's not even party political. It's really ideological. Mm. They see themselves as, like, the flame holders of the green left ideology. And, uh, and, and they have a disdain for mainstream Australia. That's the thing that saddens me most. I mean, I support the ABC. I think it should have a great role. I think it's one of the greatest cultural institutions in this country. Therefore, it needs to know and understand and reflect mainstream Australia. But so much, so much of what they do is disdainful of mainstream mm. Australia. They yeah. think mainstream Australians are racist, selfish rednecks. And as you and I know... They are not. They're the most tolerant, generous, Correct. embracing people you could ever imagine. I want to talk about US politics because you went there before the last US election. You have a keen interest in US politics uh, and it certainly shows in the Kenny report. Did Trump deserve another shot? He was the master of his own demise, let's put it that way. If he just managed the pandemic in a sensible, sober way he would have been re-elected. Mm. And I think in many respects it would have been better for the US for him to get another term because he was draining the swamp. And particularly in foreign policy, I really respected what he was doing. Yeah. Those three peace deals in the Middle East were largely because of Trump. He was putting pressure on China. He was forcing even the European allies to do more when it came to their sharing the workload of NATO. So I, I think Trump was a success in foreign policy and we've already seen with his demise, Iran getting more belligerent, China getting more belligerent, the Middle East are falling into conflict again because of the strength of Trump, Trump being taken away. Yeah, yeah. But, but he did deserve to lose because the way he handled the pandemic was ludicrous. I mean, it wasn't his doing and the media coverage was absurd, but the, the, he, he just wanted to take the brakes off too early. You needed to have controls and restrictions and lockdowns at some level to get on top of the, the virus, and he just wasn't prepared to do that because he was too scared of the economic consequences. Finally, Donald Trump described cancel culture as totalitarianism. My questions to you are, was he right? And is it winning? He was right, and it is winning. And that's that's another... These are the reasons I liked Trump. Initially, I didn't support him. I didn't want him to win in 2016. I thought he was too scary. But those things I loved about him, he fought back against cancel culture, against the woke movement, against the left. He was trying to fight back for mainstream values. Sure, he overreached at some times. That was the sort of bloke he was. But, yeah, cancel culture is totalitarianism. It's thought control. It's silencing anyone who disagrees with you rather than having the exchange of ideas. So, in many ways, it's against all the freedoms and liberties that we stand for and that America's always stand for. And, sadly, I think Joe Biden's just so weak that he'll just let this stuff run uh, unchallenged. Uh, and so th there's a reckoning on these issues coming for America and it won't happen under Joe Biden. Thank you very much for sitting on the couch, mate. The agony's over. Great to talk to you, uh, <laughs> Ed, Chris. And now people will realise that we're actually two different people. Yeah, they, keep, they said, what a great documentary you put together. I said, I'll take that. I'll take that. I've got the same Christian name. That's it. Thank you, mate, for coming on. Great. Cheers.